Hi, it's Dr. Robert Seichert. Thanks for tuning in to episode number 44 of the Doctor Podcast Show. We appreciate it. And if you like the show, please follow and subscribe and like this episode and repost it as well. Today, I have a great guest, Dr. Michael Polisi. Dr. Polisi is a professor in the Department of Urology at the prestigious Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York City. He's also the chairman of the Department of Urology at the Mount Sinai Downtown Union Square Center. And Dr. Polisi is one of the top urologists uh, in the country with great expertise, especially in robotic surgery, which is a very hot topic these days, uh, which we'll talk about. So thanks very much uh, for taking the time to come today. I know you're very busy, so I really appreciate the time uh, you're, you're taking to be here and talk to us about these uh, topics. Tell us about uh, your background, how you got interested in, in urology after medical school, and, and how many years of training beyond the four years of medicals that, did it take to become a urologist? Sure, sure. So thank you again for having me. This is a nice our, opportunity. and Our uh, pleasure. And uh, always fun to talk a little bit about urology with another colleague. And um, so how, why did I start urology? Well, it's not something I looked at right away after uh, during medical school. Um, it was one of those areas that I think just sort of fell in my lap one day and I realized that it was a great sort of um, meld of technology, um, surgery, the ability to do big cases in the operating room, the ability to do small cases in, in, the, in the office. Um, there's longevity, meaning we have many of our colleagues are working into their 70s, 80s, even 90s, and so that's the nice thing about being a urologist, you're a surgeon, but yet can, you can still be very productive even in the office, um, supporting your other colleagues and your other staff. Um, it's, a, it's a very academic uh, field as well, a lot of technology-oriented um, devices, and so I get to play with a lot of new toys every, right. every day, new gadgets. Every, every new gadgets, and that's really a, a lot of fun. Um, and so there's a lot of, there aren't a lot of fields that are like that. We have, uh, we, we encompass what's all called endoscopy or a video camera, uh, a video, videoscopic uh, um, uh, surgery. We do laparoscopic surgery. We do robotic surgery. And in fact, urology was, were, were sort of the pioneers of robotic surgery and we were leading the field and bring a lot of our colleagues and other disciplines along with that. And so when I started, actually robotic surgery was very much in its infancy. Um, laparoscopy, which had been around already for since the 1960s, the gynecologists were using it, the general surgeons were using it. Urology sort of picked it up actually relatively late, so like sort of in the 90s. And so when I trained, I trained in an era where I was one of the last surgeons probably that learned uh, open surgery very well. I was also trained in laparoscopic surgery. And by the time I sort of graduated, robotic surgery was just coming onto sort of the horizon. So I really got, really got to be exposed to all three of those things. Uh, I did a fellowship in robotic and laparoscopic surgery. This was back in 2003 uh, at Cornell. I did my original training in, in Baltimore uh, and then came back to New York uh, after, uh, after being in Baltimore for six years. I was, I was actually a medical student at Mount Sinai. So in oh, many ways, so back. came back to where, you know, where I started. Uh, funny enough, I was even born at Mount Sinai, so really, really? sort of, yeah, really, coming, really back, really coming back, yeah. So um, I did the fellowship at, at Cornell, and then they, I got hired basically to go to Mount Sinai and start the robotics program. And wow. so at the time when I got there, they had already actually purchased a robot, and this was actually the, what had happened in a lot of the hospitals around the country. It was originally purchased for cardiac surgeons. The thought was that you would do sort of open heart surgery underneath the breastplate uh, with the robotic arms without actually doing a big, big inc a thoracotomy, a big incision. Um, and uh, it quickly became apparent that the, th the thoracic and, ro and uh, heart surgeons really didn't like it. Oh. And so a lot of this equipment sort of got pushed into the corner and really wasn't being used. Uh, it was urologists who re realized that it was great for doing prostate surgery. So they were able to sort of work in a very tight space, one by two inch space. Uh, we had magnification 10 times, and so we were able to do surgeries that previously you were sort of looking at a deep hole, trying to do these operations. I used to call it fashion seal surgery. So everyone would sit around, look, put their heads into the into the abdomen. No one could see anything. All you see is the back of the scrubs. It says fashion seal. It's the company that made them. So, <laughs> I was wondering what fashion seal is. Yeah, yeah okay. so that was always a big joke as, as residents that, you know, you're, you're, you're standing in these, these three-hour cases and you really don't get to see anything. So robotic surgery really changed it. So you could actually see what was going on. You could actually really uh, be a part of that operation. Right. And, and the teaching was amazing. So I realized it right away, this was sort of the future of, of, um, of uh, urology, right. the future of our surgical field. So I was exposed, like I said, to laparoscopic surgery and came to Mount Sinai and really just started, jumped right into doing the robotic portion. 
So how many years of residency is the urology residency and internship after medical school? So most residency programs are about five years. Five. Some are six years. I actually did a six-year residency. Um, this was in Baltimore where five years were clinical. One year was research, and that was, I did that at Johns Hopkins. Um, so I had a great year that year. I worked with uh, some really great mentors there, Dr. Arthur Burnett, uh, who's, uh, who's on staff there. Uh, Patrick Walsh, who is uh, the sort of the father of, of, of prostate cancer, was the chairman at the time. So that was also wonderful. I got to really get a little exposure with him as well. Um, and after leaving Baltimore, I came up to New York, back to, you know, back to uh, where my roots, so to speak. And my mentor there is uh, Dr. Ernie Sosa and Dr. Joe Del Pizzo. And I really had a great experience there learning laparoscopic surgery. And so that was a fellowship beyond a the... fellowship, yep. How so, long was that? So that was a one-year fellowship. Oh, so that was so. six years of residency, another year of fellowship. And so at that time, you're already now seven years post-medical school. That's nothing. And you're I, an old man. <laughs> I interviewed a heart surgeon a few days ago, yeah, and yeah. he did ten and a half right. years of training. Right. So right. seven is... I mean, you could, uh, there, there was other things you could do, but yeah, seven years was enough. <laughs> well, that's great. And so you're, you're back in town. What sort of urologic conditions do you treat? What are some of the most common ones? So much of what I do now is kidney-related and BPH-related. So uh, like anything in life, you sort of have to start to, so not only am I doing minimally invasive surgery, uh, robotics, laparoscopic, endourologic surgery, um, kidney surgery is, is probably one of my, my main areas that I focus on. I do a lot of kidney cancer, kidney mm. stones. Uh, I work with a kidney transplant team. I do the kidney donors. I take care of a lot of the urologic issues for these patients as well. Um, so I do a lot of endoscopies, so ureteroscopies, percutaneous nephrolithotomies. Um, these are surgeries to remove stones uh, either through the back, uh, what's called a PCNL or percutaneous nephrolithotomy, or going up into the ureter and into the kidney or through ureteroscopic surgery. Right. Um, BPH surgery or benign prosthetic hyperplasia, so in large prostates, uh, takes up a lot of uh, the time as urologists. Um, and there's, we do robotic surgery for that. We do something called a robotic simple prostatectomy where we go in, remove the prostate, particularly in very large glands. Patients get, uh, are usually, can either be, it can either be done as an outpatient uh, procedure or they stay overnight one night. Right. They have a catheter, 10 to 14 days we later remove it, and it's pretty dramatic for a lot of these patients how well they do. Right. Now, you mentioned different types of surgery. Can you tell us the difference between the open surgery from the old days and laparoscopic surgery? Sure, And sure. now the robotic surgery. What's the difference uh, between those? Well, so the idea of minimally invasive or, so, uh, or, per or um, small keyhole surgery is exactly what it sounds like. We're, we're doing big surgeries through small incisions, the idea being that we want to create less trauma to the body. We want to do everything with a smaller incision, getting patients back to work quicker, uh, quicker recovery. So open surgery still has a role, and, and again, it depends on the so type of surgery. So that's a big doing. incision, basically. That's, a big, that's, that's, that's usually a big incision. That's right. the old days. Uh, in the old days, when we didn't have laparoscopy or we didn't have robotic surgery, that's how you did remove tumors. That's how you corrected problems inside the body. Nowadays, we can do those big surgeries through really, or a little tiny camera. Um, and uh, so I should start with that the, 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 there's a sort of an evolution in technique. So minimally invasive surgery went from open to laparoscopic surgery. So what is laparoscopic as compared to open? So laparoscopic surgery is using uh, video cameras. Uh, so I, I tell a lot of patients it's a little bit like driving a stick shift versus an automatic car. So laparoscopy, you're, you're, you as the surgeon are, are holding, we call them sticks, we're, hold, we're holding the instruments themselves. While with robotic surgery, there's actually a, a system or a device that's holding those those sticks or cameras, and you're controlling it on a sort of a console. With like a joystick, like on joystick, a video game almost? A joystick, but more sort of like a, a hand grip that you use. You, it's almost like a virtual chamber that you're in. You can visualize everything in 3D. You have the ability to magnify the area. You can also set the tremor mode, meaning that the, the scale the mode, so either it's, it's a direct one-to-one -one relationship or if you're on a very sort of delicate area that you're operating on, you can set it for one to two or one to three times. So the, the movements are, are, are mimicking your hands, but at a lesser level. So if you're working around a nerves, for instance, or, or any, any, anything that's very delicate. So basically the open surgery to laparoscopic shrunk the incision a lot, but your hands were kind of still in there with these sticks or devices or video cameras. But now robotics 
actually the robot is inside the incision and you're controlling it through uh, so it's software. Like, it's not really the robot. You are still controlling it as a right. surgeon. It's not like the robot is, is autonomous. We're not, yeah, we're not right. there Yeah, right. You're yet. controlling yeah. it. Right. Um, and, and, so that, and so the interesting thing about robotic surgery, that's also even uh, sort of uh, um, been changed over time. So we, we call it now, there's, there's a difference now between multi-port robotic surgery, which means you have multiple little uh, sort of uh, trocar areas or multiple little entryways. Uh, and there's near, is a new new division called single port robotic surgery. So everything is done through one incision, one small uh, one incision. small incision, usually wow. less than three centimeters in size. And so that's also starting to revolutionize what we're doing. We're able to do big t kidney tumors, for instance, send patients to home the same day, uh, depending on sort of you know where where the entry point is. Uh, we do it for BPH surgery, for prostate cancer surgery. So it's really changing a lot of what we're doing. I'm actually a pioneered a, an operation called a single port donor nephrectomy. So we're removing someone's kidney for donation. So and this is somebody who's donating a kidney to mm -hmm. somebody who's in kidney failure and needs a kidney transplant. Correct. So absolutely. you're removing the donor kidney. Oh, I'm removing one of the kidneys. One of the well, kidneys, we, right. Which is what we're, we're figuring out which one makes the most sense. Right. Which one's going to be the safest to implant in the recipient. Usually it's a family member, a friend, someone who's right. close. Uh, and the idea being why a single port operation makes sense is because we're reducing the amount of incisions that are being done. We want to reduce the amount of pain that the patients are experiencing and ideally re reduce the recovery time. So the patients uh, who, are, who are donating their kidneys, we want to get them back out in the work right. and back to life as quickly as possible. And so we're really starting to see some real uh, improvements on the original operation, which was called right. a open laparoscopic uh, donor nephrectomy. Right, now correct me if I'm wrong, kidney's about the size of a fist, wouldn't it? It's a little bigger than that. A little it's bigger than that. So how do you get uh, something bigger than a fist out of a small incision? So it's a great question. Sort of like, uh, if you think of it, like a, how do you get a baby out of a, out of a, out of a, out of a mother, right? With a C-section scar, you know, we don't, right. make these, we don't make these huge incisions to get babies out. Right. You sort of have to you know, bring Compressive. the head out first and, 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 turn, and turn the baby. Do the same thing with the kidney. So we, we sort of uh, bring the, the head of the kidney out and then we can, we can bring it through a much smaller incision than you expect. Right, without really hurting it. So you can kind of compress it and still keep the blood vessels and everything intact. Correct. So that's that's the idea. Of course, we want to make sure the kidney is is unharmed when it comes out. We want to make sure that when it goes to the transplant surgeon and then gets put into the recipient, that it works it works just as well as it did in the original original host. Right. How much time do you have between getting the donor kidney out and transplanting it into the person who's getting it? Um, so you've got actually a decent amount of time. I and mean, we're you know we're talking you know not hours but certainly minutes, uh, even up to you know 15, 20 minutes if oh. you have to. Most of the time, that transfer is at less than five minutes, four or five minutes at the most. So you're um, in the adjacent operating room, so, basically? So usually what happens is our transplant surgeon comes into the room. They're waiting for me to bring the kidney to them. Right. We then I bring the kidney over to what's called the ice bath. We then identify the vessels, and we instill a, a fluid, uh, sort of an antioxidant fluid inside, the, the pr preservation fluid that prevents sort of degradation of the cells and degradation or breakdown of the, of the, um, of the tissue. Right. Uh, and there, and once it's in, once it's in an ice bucket, once it's got the preservation fluid in it, you actually have quite a bit of time. You can you can even wait a, a full twenty four hours or longer, and the kidneys work beautifully. The preservation fluid sounds interesting. What what is in there actually? Because I know I do corneal transplants. Right. We have special fluid that we can keep a cornea in for about five to seven days. Yep. But the kidney's different. It's got a blood supply. The cornea doesn't. What what's in that fluid? Do you know, it's a, it's a great question. So so the fluids have changed quite a bit. There's a, obviously a lot of antioxidants that are in there, uh, preventing uh, cellular degradation. Um, and honestly, I wouldn't even know anymore what, what's in these fluids because it, it, it keeps changing every year. They keep, keep improving upon and it. And it keeps, right. In the old days, we could only save a cornea for a day or two. Right. But now, as the fluid medium has improved, we can do it for, for about a and week. And that's the same with, with kidneys as well. You know, so the, right. the, 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 the ability to sort of save kidneys and preserve them, organs in general, has really dramatically changed a lot. Right. Now, you do also a lot of uh, kidney stone surgery, I do, right? yes. And yeah. uh, why do people, why are there so many kidney stones? I hear that from a lot of my patients. They tell me about their eye problems, and they tell me, oh, I just had a kidney stone removed. Right. Well, it's unclear why we're seeing so many kidney stones. However, it's probably a combination of issues. People are just busier than they've ever been. They're not paying attention to their water intake. Uh, their diet is also not what it used to be. They're not sort of eating a well-balanced diet and st uh, starting to eat things that um, can cause uh, kidney stones. 
And funny enough, uh, a lot of these sort of uh, quote unquote uh, fashionable diets or, or healthy diets can actually cause kidney stones because really? there's a lot of oxalate in them. So a lot of leaf, leafy green vegetables, for instance, kale, is teeming with oxalate. And so really? if you're already prone to having kidney stones and you're eating a lot of uh, kale, for instance, or, 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 or salads in general, so a, I, not, I tell my patients problem. for their eyes yeah. they should be eating kale, spinach, right. broccoli, but I'm um, really increasing their risk of kidney stones. Uh, possibly. You know, possibly. So if, if someone's already at risk for having kidney stones, no, no right. question that could be part of it. So, so what you have to do, you have to, you have to sort of balance that out with water intake, hydration, uh, and then and obviously things are moderation. Right. So it. if you stay very hydrated, your risk of getting kidney stone is reduced because the, yes. it's diluted. Everything Absolutely. is diluted. Absolutely, yeah. Now, there are different ways to get rid of kidney stones. There, there's a lithotripser, I believe, a right. device that kind of vibrates and, and gets rid of them. Uh, why do some people have that as opposed to having surgery like you do to remove right. the stone? So there's really three ways surgically that we remove stones. So actually, there's really four ways, I guess. And what if you don't, if it's a non-surgical, is medical therapy or medical expulsion therapy. So you can either uh, you can either try to break down the stone with medications. Um, you can either try to propel the stone out with also medications to sort of force it out of the body. Um, or you can surgically go in and remove them. And there's really three different methods for that. So number one is, I think you mentioned lithotripsy or extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy or ESWL. This is sort of the, 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 uh, the classic where someone used to be in an ice bath or in a, in a bathtub and you would send sound waves to the body to try and break up the stones. Luckily, you don't have to sit in an ice bath anymore or a bath in general. Right. Uh, but it's, it's, the principle is still there. You're using a machine that sends the sound waves and you're putting a focal point right at the stone to try and break it into little fragments. Wow. Um, there's reasons that we don't, well, it's, it's still being used, but it's not as fashionable as it used to be. It's not as effective as some of the other uh, treatments mm -hmm. that we have, but why it's still around is because patients like the idea, it's very, it's minimally invasive. There's no cutting, there's no right. incision. You can do it with a very light sedation uh, with a MAC anesthesia. And so there's their advantage to that. If you've got a nice soft stone and it's relatively small, um, sometimes it as well makes a lot of sense. We can do them in, in an office setting even uh, in certain instances. And so there are, there are advantages sometimes for keep for doing that procedure. Um, ureteroscopy or an endoscopic procedures where we go in like plumbing, we go into the bladder, we go into the bladder, right. we then go up the ureter and into the kidney itself. And our scopes have really dramatically gotten smaller over the years. They're, they're high definition, 4K now. Um, we're able to bring in a laser, uh, an instrument to, to break up the stones. And wow. we're really, you know, and the technology has really dramatically improved so much that even very large stones you can do through a ureteroscopic approach. And then the laser basically breaks it up into it, small fragments? It basically turns it into dust. Really? And so it's actually, we call it and dusting. And it doesn't damage the rest of the kidney. Well, th that's the arc, right? We, you don't want to use the laser and hit the kidney, but you, right. you, you hit, the, hit the stone itself and cause a little gravel. That gravel then just gets dispelled later. Or you can physically remove it with a stone basket or, or some other way. And so, like a little device that little grabs device. the yep. stone and pulls it out. And, and it, really, it really comes down to the size. So obviously, the larger the stone, the less desirable it is to go through it with a scope. And so that brings us to the third uh, sort of surgical method called uh, a, uh, a percutaneous approach or percutaneous nephrolithotomy, also known as, P known as PCNL. And so what we do is we actually make uh, make a small incision in the and back. The, the and the kidney's go, in the back, right? In the back. In it's back. a retroperitoneal mm -hmm. organ in, in the back here. And so we literally go into the kidney and we have a, a scope that goes right into the kidney. Uh, we identify the stone and then we have a larger, sometimes it's a stone crusher or a basket, or even we use a laser. Uh, there are also ultrasonic lithotripsers, so actually a device that can kind of chew up the stone, almost like a, um, almost like a, uh, a jackhammer in many ways. A micro jackhammer. <laughs> micro jackhammer, exactly right. And so the really large stones, we call them staghorn calculi, need to be taken care of that way. Um, the final thing, which go, brings us all the way back to robotic surgery, is if you've got a really big stone that's kind of sitting in the middle of the kidney, some of them grow to be four, five, six centimeters in size. You can that's literally like two or three inches. Two or three inches or bigger, so the size of uh, you know lemons basically, or, or really? larger than that. You know, wow. Some will even get to, to get to be the size of you know, a small grapefruit. Um, you can make a little incision in the kidney and literally just pluck it out and close it back up, and 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 you can take care of it that way. And that's preferable for these very large stones, and I actually specialize in that as well. So because it's a again it goes with the robotic approach. Right. So you can do that through a tiny incision. Also, through how a tiny do you? Incision. 
suture up the kidney through a tiny incision, the, the robot can do that? Oh, yes. Yeah. So that's, 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 that's the wonderful thing about it is that you can get into very small spaces and you can, you can delicately sew back the kidney, close it up. You put a little stent inside, sort of almost like a little straw or tube that diverts the urine away from the incision, lets it heal. A few weeks later, you bring back the patient, you take out the stent, and, and in general, they, they do very well. So, I mean, th this has dramatically changed how we do surgery in the last 20 years. I mean, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, we would have to do most of these surgeries open. Right. Now everything's done through these minimally invasive approaches. And, and most of the time, patients are, like I said, can go home the same day, and if not, if not the same day, the very next morning. Right. The Da Vinci device, I think, is the most popular one, or at least the one yeah. I know about. Yes. Is, is that the one you use, or are yeah. there so, other so that's the one that sort of has the, the corner of the market. It's kind of like the Coke of uh, <laughs> Coke or Pepsi of the of the uh, has a true monopoly on on the market. Really, um, it's changing. You know, there's new there's new com competitors coming out, but they have such a uh, such a dominance of, uh, of who's been using it. They're already on a, on a fifth uh, fifth generation, which I actually just got to try last oh, week. Really? It's not even on the market yet. Um, they're just about to sort of launch it into uh, into clinical um, clinical use. Um, one of the, uh, so what, what was considered disadvantages with the robot was that you didn't have something called tactile feedback. So when you, when you, right. when you actually touch something inside, you didn't get the feeling that you were touching it, so you would have to use your visual cues to determine how much pressure to put on there. Right. So this new generation actually has tactile feedback. Really? As interesting, I, when I started using it, I wasn't sure that I would actually like it, but I think it does. It will add some some more sort of complexity and some ability to do more complex surges, co complex surgeries, uh, because you have that tactile feedback now, which is kind of interesting. Um, it's gotten a little bit smaller. The visualization is a little bit better, a little bit easier to use. So every every time one of these new sort of devices comes out. There's always little small upgrades that they make to try to improve upon it. And so, yeah, I'm excited to use it once it's really out. It's great. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Now, you mentioned also you do kidney cancer surgery. Correct, yes. Also uh, through the robot. Through robotic surgery, yes. Right, yeah. and, and so you can make a small incision and, and take out the cancer? So uh, depending on the size of the, 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 um, the tumor, where it is exactly on the kidney, um, that all helps, it. well, that's, that is a determinant of how easy it is or how feasible it is to remove the tumor. Generally, stage one tumors, we try to do what's called a partial nephrectomy. So we want to remove just the tumor, leave the rest of the kidney behind. Um, larger tumors, so stage two, these are seven centimeters or larger. There's some of them you can do through a partial. Many of them you can't if they're already sort of growing in the main blood supply or they're growing very close to, um, to a sort of an area where we could potentially leave cancer behind. Um, in which case, you would then do what's, what's called a radical nephrectomy. Um, where you remove the entire kidney okay. and make sure you get all the cancer out. So right. a lot of it dictates what you know what we find. Luckily, with the fact that there's so many imaging studies that are now done for all sorts of different reasons, we catch a lot of these cancers very early when they're still stage ones, and so that gives us a lot of options to take care of them uh, through partial nephrectomy. Right. And you can image these cancers and stones with MRIs, CAT scans, other devices, so you can see exactly where they are, their exact size, where they are in relation to blood vessels and things? Absolutely. And, and, and actually, there's even there's a lot of uh, technology now looking at uh, sort of 3D, 3D imaging. We do reconstruction sometimes if there's a very complex tumor. We want to see exactly where the blood supply goes to see if it's even feasible to save the kidney. Right. At least for instance, if someone has a solitary kidney where they only have one kidney, and losing the kidney completely will put them on dialysis. It's preferable to obviously leave as much kidney function behind. Right. And so that's one of the instances where we really do take that time. I, I did a segment a few weeks ago on the new Apple Vision Pro yes. device, which mm -hmm. is a VR device. Is, is that being incorporated into robotics? Do you think um, you'll eventually be wearing one of those to do your robotics so surgery? So it's interesting you say that. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's a lot of, we, we've looked at things like that in the past, even when there were Google Glass came out, right. there, was, there was a lot of these sort of, um, sort of uh, these partnerships that were happening. So no, no question, I think the future will, will definitely bring that. Mm. Um, this new DaVinci 5 is the, one of the reasons it's coming in the market is sort of incorporate an AI component. Mm. Um, and the idea would be exactly like you said, you would, you would be able to sort of film, for instance, so as a mentor, as if you have a, have a mentee, you're the mentor and a mentee, <clears throat> you have a surgery that you want someone to mimic, you can, you can take your surgery and then superimpose it upon someone else's surgery from on an AI perspective, and then tell the, the mentee surgeon, look, you're not doing it correctly, you have to hold your, you have to hold your uh, needle another 45 degrees, or you have to put more pressure on this. So there's lots of ways that we think we can improve upon the, the education so and the importance. Maybe a great teaching device as well, exactly. as, well yeah. as potentially 
essentially helping you with the surgery. That's what we think, yes. Yeah. What about uh, prostate cancer? It's one of the most common cancers in, in, uh, in men. I think I read there are about 300,000 cases of it a year, and about 10% of those people die from it. Correct, Why, yes. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the BPH, or benign prostatic hyperplasia, or hypertrophy. Right. Why do men get that, and why do men get prostate cancer? Do we know? It's a great question. Uh, you know, it's, it's an organ that really doesn't have a lot of function. Uh, it's really just designed to give a little fluid basically for, for uh, semen. And uh, besides that, we're not really sure what else it's, it's there for except to cause problems as you get older. Right. Uh, and potentially, as you said, become cancerous, uh, become enlarged, causing them pressure, inability to urinate. Uh, and then the final thing is there's something called prostatitis, which is sort of an inflammation or potentially an infection of the prostate, which also could be an issue. Um, yeah, prostate cancer is, is the most common cancer in men, um, and uh, luckily most men don't die of it, but there's, there's a certain percent, 10%, like you said, every year that, that, that do die of it. And so it's enough, uh, enough men that obviously we need, we need to be uh, sort of vigilant about it and continue to screen for it. And that's, uh, there's a big controversy about whether, whether we should do that or not. Right, I wanted to ask you that. There's also race and uh, age predilection. Uh, Correct. So, so race uh, does, does play a role in it. Uh, black men are particularly prone for getting prostate cancer at a younger age and, uh, mm. and a much more aggressive form of it. And so we're, uh, in general, we, 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 we screen very highly in uh, black men, uh, and particularly younger black men as well, uh, with a strong family history. These are the ones that uh, right. are, are more likely to have a more aggressive form. Um, but, uh, and, and, and what the controversy is, is that we use the screening tool is something called pro prostate-specific antigen. It's a blood test uh, right. that, that the prostate admits that we can pick up. And why it's controversial is because the PSA can go up for lots of different reasons. It doesn't have to just be for cancer. It can be for inflammation, for infection. Uh, it could have been from a, uh, for instance, you were out riding your bike for 30 miles and just had a, and you were sitting on your bike seat for a long period of time. Right. Uh, it could be after intercourse or anything. So there's a lot of reasons why there's there's some uh, elevations, and then these elevations then lead to more tests, which then can lead to unnecessary biopsies and. And so from a perspective of, you know, can, can, is, is this a test that should be done? Well, as urologists, we, st we believe so. We, we, because we use it in sort of a certain way, not just as a, as a simple number, but we look at the trend of the numbers. We look to see whether or not there's an elevation over time. We look to see what's called how fat, what's called the doubling time or the velocity, how quickly the, the PSA goes up. Uh, but there's also many other new tests that we're using. We're using MRIs. We're using something called a three Tesla uh, prostate MRI to help us delineate if there's an area that looks suspicious. Uh, we have now genetic markers as well. We have uh, abilities to sort of identify whether or not there's more likely or less likely for prostate cancer to be there. Um, in particular, we're looking for genetic material sometimes in certain high-grade right. prostate cancer. So all this combined, really the, the bottom line is to figure out whether or not a biopsy needs to be done. And that biopsy then will help us to let us diagnose prostate cancer. And even if you are diagnosed with prostate cancer, not everyone needs treatment. So it really depends mm. on, the, on the type of cancer you have, the aggressiveness, the amount that's in there. So all this needs to be factored in. Right. So for the audience out there, for the men, um, at what age should somebody start testing their PSA mm -hmm. if there's no family history of it at all? And then at what age if there is a family history? Those are... So uh, it's, a, it's a great question. So that, that, that number has changed a lot over the years, and uh, we, you know, there's, there's definitely, definitely uh, different guidelines to, that are available. The American Neurologic Association has recently changed their guidelines again in 2023, and so they, they basically recommend men in their 50s to early 70s get, uh, get, get, uh, get, get tested with PSA. Every um, year? Well, it used to be every year. Now they're actually being a little more liberal, but every two to four years. Okay. Um, because it is a relatively slow-growing cancer. Uh, most urologists are still recommending once a year, uh, probably because we're not really comfortable in <laughs> two to four years, even right. though the data does show it's probably just as safe to do that. Um, and, and there were some studies that there were some very large uh, scale studies that were done in Europe and in the United States that, that corroborate that. But I think most urologists still are kind of ad adhere to the once a year. Uh, routine, which I actually personally do as well, and many patients still like the idea of coming once a year. They don't like the they right. don't like the idea of waiting two to four years and right. in between. Uh, what testing. if there's a family history? So it's a great question. So so family history, we certainly start that a little bit earlier. Obviously, if there's a racial predilection for it, we also start you a little bit earlier as well, already in your 40s. Um, I have men, for instance, who come in with a father and a brother who have had prostate cancer. They're, they're 35, 36 years old, and they, they, their, their parents or their, their father, grandfathers had prostate cancer in the past. We'll probably even start them already in their 30s, depending on.
on sort of what's going on. Right. Um, so we, we do tailor sometimes the screening based on, on, on some of the, the family history and some of the genetic, fa uh, genetic makeup of, of the patient that we're dealing with. Right. Now, there are different ways to treat uh, prostate cancer, and this has been also controversial, I think. There's active surveillance right. where you just follow it. Uh, then some people have surgery to remove the prostate cancer, and then some have radiation. Right. How do you determine what the best treatment is for, for a patient? So same thing, it really depends on the type of cancer we're dealing with, uh, the PSA level, what the imaging study shows us, what some of the genetic markers uh, tell us as well. Um, in general, active surveillance is for men with low-grade, low-volume cancer. Uh, they might be slightly older. They might so have, they've had a biopsy. They've and, and you always grade had a biopsy. the cells. Correct. We grade right. the cells and something called the Gleason score. Uh, the Gleason score is meant to be from one to ten. The reality is we really don't count anything until it hits six. And so, someone who has a Gleason score six, low volume disease, meaning that the biopsies that we take show a very small percent of positive cells with a low PSA, I means so when I say low PSA, we're talking less than 10 or even mm -hmm. lower. Um, these are men that we put on active surveillance and they can stay on active surveillance for years, you know, some 10, 15, even 20 years. Um, there's a lot of people who believe Gleason score six, low volume disease, is not something we need to treat at all. Mm. Uh, and so there, there's a whole um, school of thought that those are the patients that we just should treat as if they don't have cancer. Um, and so that, that there's no, no question, there's a lot of evidence to show that, but cancer like that can also progress over time. That's why you need to continue to monitor, and hence the name active surveillance. You will continue to get uh, biopsies over time. You'll continue to get imaging studies. Um, we continue to get PSAs, and so you're still actively being followed. So the key word is active. You right. can't just kind right. of forget about it and disappear for five years. Right, and that's actually called watchful waiting. So, <laughs> so we do have a term for that if you decide that you really don't want to do much of anything. Uh, and some people do. Some people decide that, you know, so if you're 80 years old, you've had three heart right. attacks, uh, you probably are not going to die of prostate cancer. There's probably some other thing that's, that's going to be out there. Right. What about the difference between radiation and, and surgery? Some of my patients, I take a history from them. They, a lot of the men, elderly men, have had prostate cancer. Right. Some of them tell me they had surgery. Some had radiation. Right. Most are doing very well. The ones who've had surgery have tend to have more complaints than the one who had radiation. What's so, so it depends on, on the patient, right? Um, so, re, so surgery, I think, in the younger male, the one who's got a, a more longevity, surgery probably makes a lot more sense, particularly if it's uh, uh, isolated. I mean, we know localized prostate cancer, where we believe the cancer is still very much inside the prostate. Uh, reasons being is because if you get there early enough and you're able to remove the cancer, you can do what's called a nerve sparing approach so that you keep the nerves that are uh, responsible for erections and for continence uh, intact. Um, and then the, the most important thing is following them, following patients afterwards. You don't really need much except the blood test. So the PSA, all you right. do is you do a PSA once a year. As long as that's zero, you know you're in good shape. Um, and so there, there's real value in that. And men who've had prostate cancer and undergo prostatectomies and do well, they, it, it's probably the, the, the most, um, out of all the treatments, it's probably the one that makes the most sense uh, from, from multiple different reasons, uh, more, more importantly because it's just an easy way to monitor you and make sure that you're not getting a recurrence. Right. Now radiation can be done as a primary uh, treatment. So usually we reserve that for older men or men who have a lot of comorbidities. Um, and men with higher grade disease that are not going to do well with surgery uh, or not candidates for surgery, that's where radiation comes in. You can also do radiation after someone has had surgery, for instance, and you realize or we realize with the pathology that either it's A, it's a higher grade cancer or the cancer has now gotten out of the prostate, then you can still follow up with radiation at that time. And that's another advantage with surgery is that you get a better pathology, you get a better staging process as well. I okay. I see commercials on TV all the time for CyberKnife. Right. Uh, is, is that a radiation device? It, it is. Radi it's radiation. It's not. It's not surgery. And I think you know it's got a it's got a sexy name, right? So I think a lot of, right. a, lot of a lot of men are attracted to that that name. But it's truly just ra it's radiation. It's, it's high radiation. it's high dose radiation given on shorter intervals as opposed to what's the traditional external beam radiation, which is lower doses of, of uh, radiation but given over more, more often. 
I get more over more over over time. So CyberKnife is is the name of the company or is it a, a procedure? It's a, I guess it's the technique, the name of the technique. Technique. Yeah, that, right. that's that's there, and so um, it's it's become like I said, it's become a a, a popular uh, modality because of the fact that uh, it, some men like the idea that you're going, you do five or six treatments and then you're done, as opposed to the traditionally you have to go uh, three times a week for five weeks, six weeks, right. and do and do your radiation that way. Right. What are all the doctors I interview, no matter what specialty, they always tell me that exercise and, and diet is mm -hmm. important. Right. Uh, is that true in the cancers that you see, prostate cancer, kidney cancer, any relation yeah. or correlation there? Yeah, I think, I think you know, we, we, we know as a group that the cancer in general responds better to or, or, or is less likely to occur with those of us who are health, have healthier lifestyles. Um, exercising, low-fat diets, uh, uh, cardio, uh, cardiac, uh, cardiac um, uh, workouts uh, certainly help. Um, no question, prostate cancer is is, uh, is response to that. Um, kidney cancer mm. also as well. We, we really? see that as well when, when someone is healthier, stays away from smoking, for instance, and, and from uh, and from other chemicals that can lead to uh, what about uh, alcohol intake? Does that have any correlation with kidney and or um, prostate? Less or? for kidney and uh, alcohol is also sort of you know I think it's more of an association as opposed to really a cause. Um, bladder cancer is a different story. Bladder cancer, in particular, uh, if you're a smoker and, and a drinker, bladder cancer, no question, can be there. Can be a correlative to that. Right. Now you're very much into the devices and gadgets, as as we've learned today, which is great because patients get great results and quick recovery. I understand you have some patents uh, for devices yeah, so as I, well? As for, as I do that more sort of for fun. So when, I, when you're around a lot of devices and you get sort of lots of ideas, there's certain things that, um, uh, that pop into your head uh, late at night. And so I've... I've, I've, uh, I've <laughs> you wake up with an <laughs> You idea. wake up with an idea. <laughs> and what, what can we do to, to, um, to improve upon something that's already out there? Um, and yes, there's several devices that I have. Uh, there's one device in general that I, I, you know, we'd lost a needle one day in the operating room. And when you lose that in, oper in the operating room, you lose a needle, you really can't leave the operating room until you find it. And right. so you might find it in a minute or two, looking around. If you can't find it, you have to actually get an x-ray into the room to look for it. And even then, if you don't see it on the x-ray, you still have to find it before you can actually leave the room. And so we had an experience once where a needle popped mm. off uh, when we were trying to sew. And so it took us a, you know, probably a solid half an hour or so to actually find it. And of course, it, it eventually we did, and it was no, no harm, no foul. But of course, it, it, it wastes time, and, right. and it becomes very frustrating, and, and, the, and there's a lot of anxiety involved with it. So I, just, I designed a magnetic retrieval device that uh, oh. you actually can use in the body. And you know, we, we did animal studies to show that uh, if you lose a, lose a needle, you, you have uh, within... Within 10 minutes, most time, we were able to find this, uh, find the, the needle. Um, and so kind of like almost like a fire hose, you know, you know it's always in the corner. That's kind of how it was, it was designed, is that it's something that's always there or available to a surgeon if they need it. And in fact, it, it is wow, being used. Great so, idea. Yeah. Uh, so things like that. That's Those are the type of devices I've been involved with before. <laughs> right. Coming up with new ideas. Uh, now, what's your relationship to the New York Giants? Um, so, you know, I have a relationship with the New York Jets, actually with the New York Jets as well. Oh, um, really? And so uh, we do a lot of men's health uh, initiatives with them. Uh, we've, done, uh, we've done prostate cancer screening at oh. the stadiums with them. Uh, with their with their entity and with their um, with the uh, with the giant uh, system, a giant system and the jet system, which is nice. Um, and so I think teams like that are very committed to their their fans, particularly the men, because obviously a lot of men are into sports. Right. And I think it's great to meld that with our with a men's health type of a program. And in fact, we're 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 setting up a men's health program at downtown at Mount Sinai Union Square oh, uh, to do exactly great. that to try and get men to uh, sort of come in earlier to be screened for prostate cancer, but also as a holistic approach. We want them. To get evaluated for their hearts, we want to make sure their GI uh, issues are taken care of, we want to make sure their endocrine issues are being taken care of, and so we're actually in the process of, of setting that up right now. You're going to get them into the Super Bowl, too? <laughs> we'll see, we'll okay. see. I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> All right. Now, are you, your professor at Mount Sinai I mentioned, uh, are you involved in teaching and research as well? Uh, I am, yes. So I have, um, so I have a fellow, just like I, I did. So a fellow is someone who's completed their residency and wants to do an extra year. So I've been lucky enough to have great fellows uh, who come work with me for a year. Uh, and so they're with me with the operations. They're learning the, the techniques that we've been talking about. And then they go back to where, wherever they came from originally and start their own programs, usually a robotics program or a, or a so minimally you, basic the surgery. the fellows program. are robotics fellows? Robotics fellows, yeah. They're, they're, wow. it's, it's called That's the great. Advanced Robotic and 
minimally invasive spreading surgery. Spreading the knowledge, great. Yeah, exactly. And so I think, and I think that's great because it, it really just sort of imparts one-on-one -on -one, uh, the technique. We have a very large residency program at Mount Sinai. We take five residents a year, which for urology is actually one of the largest in the country. Really? Um, mm -hmm. We're actually looking, hopefully, to even expand it to six, and that would make us the largest in the whole country. Um, we also teach medical students. We have a medical school. Um, I have a research group we meet once a week, and there's anywhere from 12 to 15 people involved. Most of, uh, most of the people uh, are involved are residents and medical students and some research associates. Uh, we also even have people from other, other institutions who join us. And we're now with Zoom, it's kind of easy to have uh, lots right. of people join us. And so we present our data. We, we do some teaching and conferences uh, all across the country. Uh, I'm teaching this year in uh, different in different places, like for instance in South Korea. We'll, we're going to do a conference. Uh, we're going to do another one in Marrakesh, in Morocco. Um, I've been going to Chile. I'm going to do a robotics course down in Chile as well. Uh, they were so one of my ex fellows is now down there, and he started oh. his own robotics program. So he invited you. So he invited me to come wow. down there. So that's, that, awesome. that's that's actually where the, the it's really the, one of the best parts about this is that you really get to see the fruits of your labor, so to speak. Yeah. Right. It's very rewarding. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's great. Well, this has been very uh, educational for me, I'm sure, for the audience out there as well. I learned a lot, and uh, it's uh, really great. I want to thank you very much for taking time from your busy day to come today and teach us all this great stuff that's going on. I appreciate it. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, my pleasure. All the best. Yeah, thank you. You too.